Hello and welcome to this PIR live event webinar brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Stacey Joyce and I will be your host. Remember if you're joining us live that you can ask questions anytime throughout the webinar by clicking on the chat button in the top left corner of your screen, changing the to field so that it includes attendees and then typing it in for us and sending it in. If you're asking a question during any point of uh, presentation or demonstration, we will queue those questions up and ask them when it's time. So you don't have to hold them back. Once you type them in, rest assured that we will keep track of those throughout. So today's guests, we have two guests. We have Jen Davignon, who's a PhD student in the Department of Biology at McGill, and, uh, and Alex Crew, who's a master's student in the same Department of Biology at McGill in the Ricciardi and Gregory Eves lab. So welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. I will let you two take it away. Excellent. So thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. I, I saw that there's participants from all across Canada. We're very happy to uh, be with you today to talk about our research. Uh, so the plan is, well, our projects both focus on microplastic pollution in the St. Lawrence River. So we thought that we would first introduce you to what does that mean, microplastic, and uh, then give you a little tour of where we work and what kind of work we do about uh, this topic. Yeah. So. Anything else, Ed? <laughs> no, yeah, good job. <laughs> All right. Hopefully it works. <laughs> Oh, all right. So before we get started, we wanted to just um, give you a bit of a, a background. So if you think about all the things that you've done so far since you got up this morning, when you walk to school, when you got prepared, uh, if you take a look around the classroom as well, on your desk, on the walls, if you look at your clothes even, or your backpacks, and you take a moment to look at them, you probably realize that a lot of these things that are around you are actually made out of plastic because plastic is pretty much everywhere. It's on most of the things that we use. Uh, it can be used to wrap our foods, for example, or um, even like our clothes sometimes have a bit of plastic. So this is a bit of the part of the topic that we'll be talking to you about today but we're focusing more on microplastic. So what is the difference? Well, microplastic is very tiny pieces of plastic, too simply. So to get an idea of what size those small plastic are, uh, it's basically the size of one of your hair to all the way to the size about of the width of your pinky finger. So it's very, very tiny pieces of plastic that you normally need a microscope to see. Otherwise, they're too small. So now it's important to know that all the plastic, regardless which type it is, they're all made from oil. Normally, uh, chemical engineering will be mixing oil to different kinds of chemicals to produce different types of plastic. If you were lucky and you ever looked at some of the plastic items, for example, that you put in the recycled bin, you probably realize that in those little triangle, you have a number. This number corresponds to a type of plastic. And plastic, as I mentioned, as you probably noticed, is a bit in everything almost that we use today. So it's very durable. It is very versatile. That means that it basically can take many shapes, many forms. It can be very, very hard like a pipe, for example, or it can be very elastic and stretchy, uh, for example, like cling wraps that, where we wrap our foods around. So plastic is very made in different shapes, different forms, and we can use it in many kinds of applications. So it's very, very useful. However, because we use so much plastic, sometimes we cannot take care of it or manage it in the right way. Some of the plastic are made to be used only once, while others are, can be reused many, many times. But in general, in all the plastic that has ever been made, only one out of 10 product can be recycled. So it means that there's a lot of those plastic items that we use that become waste. Now, as an example, I'll have Alex helping me out. So when I walked to school this morning, I took five minutes to pick up stuff that are made of plastic that I found, for example, lying around on the sidewalk. So there's a lot of plastic that is being, not being recycled well or that doesn't go into the dump, but it will be found in the environment. So you have pieces of rope, plastic lids, uh, cups and um, little items, plastic straws. So there's a whole bunch of plastic items that are found in the environment. 
foam as well. So these are just an example. I found a lot more, I guess, uh, plastic items, but I just picked out a few just to give you an example. And that is a bit of a problem because plastic is not natural. We kind of created it ourselves. So it means that it doesn't really decompose, like it doesn't produce compost or turn over, disappear easily in the environment. If we compare it to food, for example, uh, like uh, if you have a banana peel or whatever, it will take normally about two months or so to degrade, while other plastic items, depending on what they are, can take between 20 years to 500 years to totally disappear from the environment. So they remain behind for a very, very long time. Now, in terms of microplastics, so the tiny pieces, they are produced in two ways either uh, from the plastic items that are found in the environment that will eventually break down into smaller and smaller pieces by being carried and pushed around or by being um, degraded just because of the ultraviolet, like the UV light from the sun, for example, they will break down those larger products into smaller, smaller pieces. Another example is uh, we used to have, for example, little beads of plastic in our soaps they were used to scrub out the dirt from our fingers, for example. Um, now they're not allowed to use those little beads in soaps anymore, but they used to be when we would wash our hands, be like dumped down the drain and end up in the rivers. So these are the two ways where we can get uh, plastic or microplastics in the ocean or in nature, either by having larger products breaking down in small pieces or having some products being made directly as beads or as fibers, for example, for clothes, any types of like fleece that you wear, or like your stretchy jeans, the stretch part is plastic. So sometimes some of the fibers, when we wash them, they'll go down the drain as well and be uh, released in the environment. So this is the types of items that we are looking at in nature. Now, why do we care really about these like small pieces of plastic that we don't really see easily in nature? It's because basically in aquatic environment, like in rivers, lakes, or even the oceans, these tiny pieces of plastic are the same size as plankton. Now, plankton are small animals that basically control um, all the life in, um, in the oceans and the rivers. They are the main food source for many, many, many animals. Basically, we say that they are at the base of the food web because all the other animals depend on them to survive. So because they're the same size, often what happens when a small fish that would feed on plankton eats the plankton, it would accidentally take up some plastic. And then it ingests it, the plastic gets stuck in its stomach, it can block its digestive system, cause it to not be able to feed very well, so it might not grow very well. Eventually, if it doesn't feed that much, it could even not live very long, so it could be killed by the plastic but sometimes it's able to just retain it. So keep it in its stomach or keep it in its body, but not necessarily be affected. But the problem becomes when another large fish, a predator, for example, comes over and eats that small fish that ate the plastic, the plastic will be transferred to that big, to that bigger fish, to the predator, which means that big fish usually eat many, many fish. And if all those fish have plastic, they can actually accumulate a, lower, low, a large load of plastic themselves. And we as scientists, we really worry about that because we know that plastic, first of all, they are made of oil, of chemicals, that some of them are toxic, but they can also attract other chemicals that are present in their environment to those plastic items as they're, for example, floating to the river. And these chemicals, toxic chemicals, can be released either in the river or in the animals when they ate the plastic. And these could have consequences on the health of these animals and in turn that means that it could have impacts on us as well because a lot of us will eat fish or other animals and so far we found that in a lot of the seafood products there has been traces of small tiny pieces of plastic found in those animals which means that it is possible for us to by accident eat plastic as well. In all the studies that have been done across the world we also found that sometimes in tap water so the water that we drink in bottled water in salt, in sugar, or even in honey, we found traces of small pieces of plastic, even in the air that we breathe, which means like everywhere we can find microplastic. So what do we do specifically uh, about this topic? Well, Alex is trying to look into the river. He's collecting samples to try and figure out 
how much plastic there is and what kinds they are. And on my slide, I look into the animals. So I collect animals that live in the river where Alex is collecting uh, the samples and I collect fish and mussels and I try to figure out if those animals ate the plastic that were in the environment. So last summer and every summer, I go out in the field, I collect fish, I collect mussels, which are pretty much um, mollusks that are a bit like pool filters. They collect whatever is in the water column and they kind of feed on it. So they're kind of big pool fil filters. So if there is plastic to be in the environment, they might take it up. Uh, I collect these animals, I bring them back to the lab, and then I look into their stomachs or their bodies to try and find plastic. So far, we found that there was fibers, so little piece of thread coming from her clothes in different kinds of fish. For example, northern pike, which is a big predator in the St. Lawrence. And we found microbes coming from those cosmetic products, from the soaps and from the wash. We found them uh, in uh, yellow perch, which is a fish that uh, a lot of people in, around the St. Lawrence eat, um, and the round goby, which feed on the mussels also that are at the bottom of uh, the St. Lawrence. Um, another thing that I do is sometimes I'll bring those animals in the lab, I'll capture them, and um, I will bring them back to the lab and I'll expose them to different concentration of microplastics. So hopefully you can see that video well. Uh, you, what you see is little pieces of orange fibers that I added to the tank and I put one muscle there. So the muscle, what I'm curious or interested in knowing is whether that little muscle will eat up the plastic at the same time as it's eating its food and how much it's gonna eat up in order to see if those animals are actually being affected by the plastic that is in the environment, for example. Perfect. And, uh, well, thank you very much, Jen. Uh, transfer over to me, where um, in return, my work is quite different than Jen's. Um, I focus more on what the concentration of plastics that we find in the water and in the sediments or the mud of the river. And what, we're in, what I'm interested in finding is whether there's certain reasons why we're finding more plastic in some sediments um, over others. Um, in particular, I'm more interested in seeing whether different types of land use, so uh, agricultural use or urban use or even natural areas um, accumulate plastic um, just because of the type of land that's in the area. Other things I'm looking at are sort of environmental variables of the river. So this includes river flow, um, water chemistry, or even uh, the sediment chemistry that we find or the mud chemistry in the river. Um, another part that we talked about is Jen mentioned how we're finding these beads coming through our face wash. Um, those actually get released from wastewater uh, plants. So one thing I'm looking at is seeing if we're finding more plastics above or below these wastewater treatment plants, um, in particular in the water of the river. Uh, similar to Jen, we do a lot of really fun field work. It's one of the best parts about being in this sort of a field is you get to spend your entire summers on the water, um, collecting things, looking at things, and just collecting samples. Um, some of the samples I collect, um, so I collect water samples, I mentioned above and below waste treatment plants. So we, here we, we see one of my assistants, she's sort of scooping water and pouring it over um, into a, over a, a filter, which then collects a lot of different materials. Um, and another thing I do is I sort of collect the mud. So I take those sort of mud or sediment samples and transfer them into a bucket, which are then transferred back to the lab. Um, at this point, we're actually going to show you around and show you not only our lab and how it works, but um, how one of the samples goes from this bucket into uh, analyzing microplastics from it. So with that, I'm going to switch over to Jen and we can get this virtual tour started. All right, so can we just make sure from a tech perspective here, we've got that first computer muted and volume down mm -hmm. and then uh, and then we'll switch over to Jen's computer. We can already see we have a bit of a look around. Um, Alex, before you run away, I will also need you to stop the screen sharing. Oh, sorry about that. That way we can see the lab as a, as a much bigger picture instead of a little tiny picture in picture. Wonderful. All right, we're all set to go now. Okay, perfect. So you can hear me now? Yes, I can. Excellent. So we'll give you a little bit of a tour of our lab. So Alex is going to show you what he does when he brings back the sediments from the field.
So as I mentioned, we'd have a big bucket of sediment. We then take sort of just a small portion of that and put it in a jar like this. We then bring it into the lab to be processed. So this is one of our few lab rooms that we have here at McGill in Montreal. Um, as you can see, like most labs, there's a lot of equipment around, a lot of boxes, a lot of samples, and overall it's just a general mess. Um, that is common with labs as you're often sharing spaces. There's a lot of different projects going on, a lot of different equipment. So it's really a tight spot, but you know, we have to make do with what we have. Um, if you follow me over here, We've got, like I said, lots of different samples. We've got machines. This is a centrifuge here, which we use to mix up samples. Um, we have over here is a ultra pure water system. Uh, we use this since we can't use tap water or bottled water, as Jen mentioned earlier, for microplastic pollution. So we need really pure water that has been filtered quite a few times in order for us to use it. Um, to our right here, we have Jen's little setup for her tanks. So as you can see, you know, some small tanks uh, where we can then have the muscles in here, there, and sort of analyze using um, an LED light to see if the plastic's in there. I don't think you can right now, but essentially this is how it's done. Um, and we have a bunch of different plastic samples here that we can use to spike it with. Uh, a common thing in most labs is a fume hood. This is where you work in to sort of when you're working with really hard chemicals. One thing our lab uses a lot is we do these things called acid washing, where we wash all our glassware and plasticware and acid to make sure that all the contaminants and all the different elements that are sort of attracted to it um, get cleaned away. And one of the most common features of a lab is a sink. We do a lot of dishes, so I'm sure if you want to become a scientist one day, you have to accept the fact that you will have to do a lot of dishes in your lifetime, so make sure you practice up and get good at that. Um, but here we'll get started and we'll show you what I will show you now is essentially how we go from a sediment sample like this to analyzing the plastics that we find in it. So the first thing that I do is I take this sediment sample and I take these metal sieves and what I do is I sort of just pour the sediment onto these sieves and whatever gets retained on the top of this I then extract out which can then be extracted for the plastics. These can range in sizes. So we have you know, larger sizes that contain a lot of leaf material and sort of would have larger plastics in it to some of the smaller sizes, which are even you know, a quarter of a millimeter so that we can get down to see even the smallest possible plastics. Um, once, we, once I need to extract the plastics out, I do this really cool thing. So as, as Jen mentioned earlier, plastics are made from oil, which means that they have properties in them that actually make them attracted to oil. So what we do is just sort of combine water and canola oil along with our, our samples. We shake them up. You can have some fun with this, making margaritas. And as that settles, since oil and, and water do not mix, the, the idea is that the water will be put on the bottom and the oil and all the plastic material that is attracted to that oil will settle in on the top. What we do then is we sort of get rid of all the water and we're, when we're just left with the oil and then we pour the oil over this sort of filter, which will then push the oil through here, but then retain any material or solid material on a filter. In return, our final result looks something like this, where there's still a lot of material on there and you can't really tell what is plastic and what is anything else. So what we get to use then is a really cool dye. We get to use this really pink, funky dye. This is called Nile Red, and it's a, a powdered dye that's mixed with methanol or an alcohol. And what this does is when I, when I drop a few droplets onto this filter, the plastics on that filter will actually absorb this dye. And when I shine a fluorescent light on it, like Jen was showing you earlier, those dyes will then bounce back and we can actually see the plastic particles that are in it. So with that, I think is more or less our virtual tour. Um, and then we'll, I think we'll just cut it off from here, but we'll go back to the slide and hopefully we can answer some of the questions you guys might have about microplastics or plastic pollution in general. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so we have our guests muted as they're switching over to a different device. It looks like you can see Jen in the field there um, in her image. Now, 
um, before we do any more slides, you can feel free to put them up if you're ready and you'll just need to unmute yourself and turn your volume up. Um, we have a question from uh, Ms. Canarellis, Can I'm sorry about that, Ms. Canarellis's class, uh, wondering how much plastic is in the larger fish and how do you test? So I think we've had a couple questions about, Jen, you are exposing the muscle to plastic or you're finding fish with plastic. How do you test to see how much plastic is within that organism? It's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, basically, a bit like the same process that Alex has described. So he takes the plastic out of the sediments um, or out of the water. Well, I'll go to the further. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, okay. So what I do is I basically take the animal, pick them up. Normally, most of the plastic will accumulate in their stomach. So I need to kill the animals, remove or dissect the stomachs out or the digestive tract. And then there's a different process. You can look through it, um, like look through a microscope to look at it visually. But the best technique that we found is to actually digest, that we say. So we use a chemical that will break down all the natural materials. So all the, for example, stomach lining and everything that the fish ate that is natural food and will leave behind just the plastic. So basically, a bit like Alex, I would use the same system, not the little um, funnel where there was the water and the oil, but I will use uh, the digestion chemical that will remove the natural material, then I will filter it in a vacuum. So on the filter, I would have left the plastic and other sometimes little pieces of things like bones and stuff that did not degrade fully. And I will use the same technique, Nile Red, the little pink solution, um, Put, it, put a few drops on the filter and then bring it to a microscope so that we can uh, use uh, the fluorescent dye that is Nile Red to count the plastic. Wonderful. Well, I will let you continue now. It looks like you have a couple more slides to show us. I think, so this was the last one. We just okay. wanted to sort of show how when we, I couldn't show you obviously in the lab, but what we do is when we do add that dye and look under the microscope, this is sort of what we see. So you can set, tell, that not everything under that we have on the slide is sort of fluorescing or bouncing back, but those that are plastic are. So this gives us, this allows us to sort of measure the plastic pollution that we find in these samples. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing those slides and for showing us around the lab. We do have a pile of questions that have accumulated while you've been telling us those things. So if you can go ahead and click the stop share button on your screen, we'll be able to see you a little bit larger as we ask you questions. Great. So. Um, let's go first to a question from uh, St. Nicholas in Barrie, Ontario, wondering um, if microplastics can hurt people if they eat them. We talked about how they go up through the food web or the food chain and eventually find their way to us. Is that harmful? Okay. So right now we aren't really sure about the, t the human effects of plastic, but as sort of Jen was talking about earlier, um, when these plastics, if they were to get sort of magnified up the food chain, so the smaller fish gets eaten by the larger fish and then we eat that larger fish, um, the, the, the damage plastics can have sort of amplifies. So I will say there is, an, uh, there is a chance that plastics could hurt us, but it largely depends on um, the amount of chemicals that have been attached to those plastics or the amount of chemicals that are leaching out of them yet, which depending on where they came from or anything like that would have an effect. But as we know right now, we, we still don't know uh, a number as to how much it affects humans or how much it can hurt us right now. Or even how much we may have in us. So it's a, a big question still that we hope that um, not, not only us, but like everybody, all the researchers around the world that are contributing to the field mm -hmm. of microplastic will be able to, ha to answer and try to find out just how much plastic we may eat and then what could be the impacts. So we normally start on looking at the impacts on smaller organisms uh, just because it's easier than looking in the stomachs of a human, for example. Or future researchers like you guys can check that, that answer and give us an answer for us. So that'd be great. 
I have a feeling that this will be an area of research for quite a while. It seems like it's fairly new on the scene that we are realizing this is something we need to know more about. So it's really interesting to see what you are finding. And as you said, uh, as these students go through their schooling and if they want to pursue research, I'm sure this area is still going to be around. We'll, we'll still be looking for more answers. Absolutely. So next we have a question from Harrison Public School in Georgetown and the students there are wondering if uh, some plastics are more likely to become microplastics than others and and in what ways do these plastics find their way into the water? Well I will say so I'm personally from Georgetown so I'm very <laughs> touched that this question is coming from there but uh, Yes, it's true. There are some plastics that break down more than others. As you can think, styrofoam breaks down to a lot of different particles a lot faster than, say, a hard, durable PVC pipe. So there are certain plastics that can have more potential for damage um, to, in, in terms of becoming microplastics. And how they get into the water is, um, well, not only is plastic pollution just from, you know, stuff that we found on the street today or anything else, but what we're finding is that, especially with these microplastics, that a lot of our wastewater treatment systems, so you know what you flush down the toilet or what goes down the sink, when those get to those sort of treatment systems that even their filters aren't able to get all the little plastic particles out of it, so there is still lots that are being released into the environment. Um, I don't know, do right. you have another? <laughs> no, that's okay. I've got plenty of questions here to ask you for sure. Um, we have a question from the 7E students at Dr. Marion Hilliard Senior Public School in Malvern, Ontario, um, wondering if there is any way to get rid of microplastics for good. Hmm. Oh, wow. That's a tricky question. Um, I think it depends on what type of plastic, like what source of microplastic we're talking about. Obviously, there has been a lot of um, le like legislation done. For example, they banned all the microbeads from like the, the soaps and other things like that. So obviously, if we are no longer allowed to use these little microbeads, well, they will not end up in the environment. So one way is to prevent microplastic from going to the environment uh, from for example, the microbeads, but also if we reduce the quantity of plastic that we use or we try to manage the wastes better so that we don't accumulate so much plastic items that uh, earlier we showed you what I collected in five minutes walking from home to the metro station. So if I saw like 20, 50, 30 cups of plastics and other things, if we can reduce how much we use and if we can like recycle them more, there could be less uh, plastic being produced or degraded and then it could help in that way. I'll say too there's a there's some really cool new inventions coming out as well. Um, one being there's an, an idea called the Cora Ball which you would throw in with your laundry so that it could collect all the fibers that maybe are shed. So I think there are people sort of working on solutions but um, similar to climate warming I think this is something that is a, a, a persistent issue that we're gonna have to deal with, with for a long time and um, Hopefully we can eventually come up with some solutions where we can solve it. Well, it's interesting that we are talking about solutions because we have a very interesting question now from Ms. Davis's class at Louis Riel School in Calgary, Alberta. And they're wondering if you think an organism or a fish could evolve or be genetically modified to break down microplastics. Um, well, so far they ha there has been some tests done or some accidental discoveries of some animals that are able to like chew down some of the plastic. Um, as far as we know, I think there was like one, the one I found that was really cool was a cat, um, yeah, it was a caterpillar. caterpillar. A caterpillar that's normally feeding on wax. So we usually find these caterpillars invading the beehives and they feed on beehive wax. And if the wax made from the bees actually have similar composition in terms of like chemistry and structure as some of the plastic. So they found that if they were put in a bag, they could, after a little bit, eat through that little plastic bag. So that could be a solution. Uh, I think there has been a few bacteria too that have colonized, for example, the big plastic items that were found in the marine systems. You might have seen on TV or something, uh, maps of big islands of plastic floating in the middle of the ocean. Some bacteria are actually colonizing, so they go live onto that plastic. So because bacteria have a very 
short life cycle and they reproduce very fast, they have the ability sometimes to evolve quickly. So they found that some of them could actually start, um, I guess, degrading some of those plastics as well. But there's no like perfect cure for it right now. And we don't know either like in the same process, if like, for example, the caterpillar ends up eating a lot of the plastic, how much can they eat in order to get rid of it? But if that caterpillar gets eaten, is the plastic leaving some residues or chemicals in the caterpillar that could affect other animals? We still don't know. So there could be solutions in the future where animals may become more adapted to the plastic. Um, it might not be that like we may not want to rely on this solution uh, in the long term, but obviously uh, there is a lot of cases where sometimes evolution helps. <laughs> right. And so a related question from uh, our students in Southwestern Ontario here, wondering if our stomach can dissolve plastic in humans. Do we know that answer yet? I, w I would say uh, we don't know the answer yet, but based off my knowledge, I would say we probably, the stomach acid probably does break down the plastic. Although, unfortunately, you know, when you do break down plastic, you do release a lot of other chemicals. So maybe, you know, while we might be able to digest physically the plastic, it might release other chemicals into our body that might not be so good. Right. Okay, well, I have a pretty specific question for Jen from Liam at Chris Hadfield School, wondering if it's imperative that you kill the animals you study or can you use an x-ray instead to, to see the plastic? That's a very good question. Unfortunately, we don't have a good way to um, see the plastic once it's inside the animal. There's many reasons. I put the, what I presented was very like short and without getting into complications, but sometimes what happens is like our cells, as they grow and they modify, they can sometimes absorb some of the plastic that are around. So they could actually become part of us, in which case, so it could be in the digestive system, but sometimes it can go into the cells as well. And that plastic would not be able to come out if we would, for example, uh, just get the content of the stomach out, for example, if we try to make the animal vomit it out or something like that because it's part of the animal. So unfortunately, sometimes when we do projects like this, we have to sacrifice a few animals. Um, what we try to do to prevent killing a lot of animals is there's a lot of research going on in, on similar species that we work on. So because a lot of researchers sometimes need to study different parts of the animal, we try to collect for example, one animal, and then we split up the parts <laughs> of the animal in different labs so that everybody can uh, perform their study, but it reduces greatly the numbers of animals that we're actually um, sacrificing for this experiment. So that is one way that we try. And if there's any modes or any ways that we can avoid it, uh, that's where we uh, go. So sometimes after we've collected a few samples, we can start to do computer models uh, depending on what we found as results, and then use those simulation or models on the computer uh, to know and answer some of our questions instead of having to go and get more animals. I find this very interesting. We talked about the field work that you do, so going out and, and doing sort of ecology, environmental science type uh, sample gathering. You're obviously doing a lot of biological studies. You've talked about uh, chemicals that you use and doing, doing um, chemical analysis and, uh, in, and now computer simulations. It seems like this is really multidisciplinary. You're really learning a lot from different areas. Do you collaborate with others a lot? Do you kind of learn all of this and do a bit of it yourselves? How does it work? <laughs> Yeah, I would say uh, a lot of, you know, obviously this is a new field. So the labs we currently work in aren't microplastic specific labs. So mm -hmm. we both work in labs that work on a lot of uh, invasive species or other food web stuff. And so we're not more or less equipped to run all these things. So we do have to end up collaborating quite a bit. Um, one thing I can think of I collaborated with is I got a lot of help from people in geography to sort of help me build these land use maps so I could figure out what is the land use of Quebec and how I'm supposed to measure that or I'm sure Jen you've had some help too with I think behavioral stuff and everything yeah. else. So. Um, yeah we're, we're trying as much to collaborate just because it's um, there are a lot of like different fields that are involved like chemistry engineering um, 
computer modeling and it means that it makes a lot of work for us. So if we want to make sure that we do it perfectly, it's easier sometimes to collaborate with people that are experts in those areas so we can make a better project and make sure that we don't forget things that we weren't able to know before just because we didn't have that knowledge, for example. Uh, but yeah, I collaborated in the field to collect samples to make sure that um, sometimes the ministry even is involved. Uh, they do collections to try to estimate how many fish there are. So sometimes they collect fish. So all the fish that they apparently like they collected and by accident were killed, they would give it to me so I can analyze their stomachs, for example, to see if there was plastic. So we tried to collaborate in different ways, either in the field, in the labs for um, different, using different materials. Sometimes the equipment's pretty expensive too. So we tried to build a, a network so that we can answer the questions more easily and then have a lot of people working together on finding answers as well. So all those lessons about sharing and working together in kindergarten, you're still using today in research. More, more than ever. <laughs> yeah, more than ever. Well, we do have to wrap up soon. I want to get to just, I think, two more questions. One from Portable 3 uh, in North Asian Court. Ms. Shepard's class has been working on a project about land use and how to protect their water and their watershed. So I'm thinking this is probably going toward Alex here. Um, what would be the best way to measure the amount of microplastics in their watershed? Mm -hmm. Well, for your whole watershed, it would be hard. <laughs> um, I will say that. But one quick thing you can do, and one thing I've sort of focused my project on, is it's not, it doesn't take a whole lot of money to extract the plastics out and measure it. So if you guys have a local beach or anything like that, you can go there, scoop up a random sample, mix it with a bunch of oil, like canola oil, which is what I use, and water, mix it up and see what you get coming out of there and then pick through and see what is plastic and what isn't. Unfortunately, to measure the total amount coming through your watershed, that'd be, that'd be pretty, that'd be a lot of work. Um, but you know, there are little things you can do to at least to get the ball rolling and maybe getting some, some more people involved with your project or getting the community involved um, and getting some, something started. So at least you get an idea of how bad your watershed is by just seeing what's on the beach or maybe on your shoreline. Um, in terms of sort of maybe if you have any ideas of reducing the, you know, if you're worried about your watershed and you want to make sure that um, it's as healthy as it can be, one thing you guys can do is actually um, go out and plant some, a buffer zone more or less. So before the entry to every river or every lake, if you were able to put some shrubs or trees or bushes in front of them, um, it gets rid of the gorgeous view, but what it does stop is on top of the plastics, but other contaminants that might get into your lake, it actually filters them out through the plants, um, which is a good way that people have sort of figured out to reduce the amount of stuff getting into your lakes and rivers. So that'd be my best advice. Well, thank you for that advice. We have one more question that's popped up a few times from uh, many of the classes who've been joining us today. What, um, did you even know about microplastics when you were kids? And, and how did you find yourselves now as researchers? Um, well, I'll say for me personally, I never saw this as a, a goal. I was a, you know, Canadian hockey playing boy when I was a kid, focused on making the NHL. But uh, it actually came very late to me. You know, this is a new issue. And in my third year of undergraduate university, I was given a group project to sort of investigate what these microplastics are and their effect that they can have. And just by doing that research, it really sort of intrigued me as this area of research that is growing. And at the time, I wasn't sure about what kind of work I wanted to do. So I, it really sort of brought me into this direction. And then after undergrad, I got involved in a lot of work with the Canadian government and policy, which sort of tied into this micro bead ban. So when I decided I wanted to go back to school, I thought this would be a great project to sort of focus on and seeing whether the bans that we put in place can have an effect on microplastic pollution. And what about you, Jen? Well, as for me, well, the field itself of microplastic became popular very recently, mainly because before we didn't have the tools or the technology that allowed us to see those small pieces of plastic as easily as we can now, though it's still very complicated, but <laughs> it's getting a lot easier now. Um, so it, I don't think it exists never heard of it when I was growing up, but I really always liked playing outdoors. So that's what pushed me in the field of like biology, ecology. I really liked to, uh, both the marine system and the aquatic, which means like freshwater, lakes and rivers, but also the ocean. So I worked in both and I was really interested by microplastics just because, well, obviously all the river 
drains the water and brings the water down to the ocean, which means whatever happens nearby where people live near the, the rivers will obviously be uh, or have impact on the oceans as well. And since I'm really interested um, in keeping all of the animals in the rivers and in the lakes and in the oceans alive, I was really worried that microplastic could be a very big issue and it could also have impacts on, on humans. So I thought it was a good topic to tackle uh, if we wanna have an impact. Sometimes you do research in your lab, you're not sure where it's going, but with microplastic, you can really see something that can maybe perhaps uh, lead to changes in laws, policies, and make an impact overall on everybody uh, across the world. So I think that's really cool for that topic. Um, yeah, and I hope that we can find some answers that will help us know more about this problem and find solutions to it. And it does seem like uh, you've mentioned a few different avenues. If, if students are interested in this topic, we've talked about policy, we've talked about chemistry, we've talked about biology, we've talked about uh, computer science, all playing a role in coming up with solutions and, and even just at this point, more information on this issue. So thank you so much. We had such a great discussion today. We got to see around the lab and, and see how you do what you do. And we really appreciate your time. No problem at all. We were very happy to be here with you guys today. <laughs> Well, if you are looking for more PIR live event webinars and other programming for the classroom, you can check out our website at pirweb.org. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today. We will see you next time.